Good evening, and thanks for joining us tonight. Um, I'm Dave, and I'll be filling in for Colin. Um, tonight, we're going to be looking at uh, one of my favorite stories in the Old Testament. It's one that, that really shows the power of God and, and how holy he is. We're going to look at a little bit of background on the story first. We're going to be in 1 Samuel as we go through this. So here we go. The first thing we're going to look at is Israel itself. This, is, this story happens during a time when Israel... Uh, was not under the rule of kings yet. So we're still kind of at the end of the judges coming in here. And Samuel wasn't around during this time. Samuel had not established Saul as the king yet. He was still young. And Israel was still in the thick of things with the Philistines. As you know, they've been longtime enemies, always fighting the Philistines, going to war with them. But right now we're, we're still in the thick of that, as we see. The other very important part here is the Ark of the Covenant. You've probably heard of that. Grammatically speaking, an ark is just a box or a chest, literally something that, that holds things. But this was a very special chest in this case. This was the one that physically uh, held the Ten Commandments that were given to Moses. So they, they held those Ten Commandments. There's also a jar of manna from the time that Israel wandered around in the wilderness. There's this jar of manna there to remind them of God's provision during that time of wondering. There was also Aaron's staff, which was used during some of the miracles during that time. Aaron's staff, the jar of manna, but most importantly, the Ten Commandments were housed in this box called the Ark. Spiritually, it was a place that God's presence dwelt in the tabernacle and later on in the temple. It was called the most holy place. This was the place where the this high priest went forth to give the sacrifices um, to God there. Figuratively, it was God's footstool here on earth. So as he sat on his throne in heaven, figuratively, his, his feet were resting here on earth. This is his presence on earth, this Ark of the Covenant. It was considered sacred. It's a sacred object um, in our religion. It was designed so that the Ark itself would never have to be physically touched. So they, they designed this Ark. They put these sacred objects in it, this, uh, the Ten Commandments, the other things are in there, and it was never meant to be touched. It was, it was built so that there was rings on the side of this ark and, and the priests would put these poles through, the priests and Levites would put the poles through the rings and they would carry this ark with the poles so that if anybody, so no one would have to touch it. If anyone were to touch it, they would fall over dead. This did happen within the, uh, within the Old Testament and God was serious about this ark remaining undefiled because this was God's presence on earth is what it represented. So we talk about Israel, what time in, the, in their history they were at. We talk about this Ark, the Ark of the Covenant, but we also have Eli's sons. You may have heard of Eli. He was a priest of God during this time. He was the one that raised up Samuel, who later went on to be a spiritual leader in Israel. But Eli also had sons of his own. He had two children, two boys. They were also priests, but they did not honor God. According to what we see here in the scripture, if you look in 1 Samuel 2, verse 12, we see Eli's sons were wicked men, and they had no regard for the Lord. So they were worthless men. They weren't really good priests at all. They took advantage of the women who served at the temple entrance. They did bad things there. They took advantage of them. They took the best of the offerings for themselves. So when offerings were given, they'd find the, the best of the meat and they'd, they'd keep it for themselves. They mistreated offerings meant for the Lord and they angered God greatly. We see this in 1 Samuel 2 verse 17. This sin of the young men was very great in the Lord's sight, for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. So that's a little background. We see where the nation of Israel is at. We see what the ark is, what it represents, what, what's going on with that. And we also see Eli's sons and what, what's happening with them as well. So here's the story. We're going to look over in 1 Samuel chapter 4, starting in verse 1 and 2, and on through 3 and 4 here as we look through the story. Now, the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines. That was pretty normal. They did that a lot. The Israelites camped at Ebenezer and the Philistines at Aphek. The Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel. And as the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines who killed about 4,000 of them on the battlefield. So we see that the, the Israelites are getting together as, as usual. They're going out and fighting the Philistines. But in this battle, 4,000 of them died. So it was not a very successful battle at all. So we, we see what's going on here. Israel does not win in this battle. So they have to retreat. This happens a lot in the Old Testament when they're battling the Philistines. We can easily infer from the, the earlier passages about Eli's sons that this was a period in which Israel was not honoring God. We have priests that aren't honoring God. That means the nation as a whole who is being led by these priests are not honoring God. And when Israel doesn't honor God, God lets their enemies beat up on them and win. 
This happens a lot. 4,000 Israelites were killed in this battle. So it's easy to say things didn't go well, but they wouldn't let that hinder them. They came up with what they thought would be a brilliant plan. I mean, in their minds, this human wisdom that, you know, they're not listening to God. They're not following what God says. They come up with their own idea. And here's what they do. Let's read on. Verses three and four. When the soldiers returned to camp, the elders of Israel asked, why did the Lord bring defeat upon us today before the Philistines? That's a really good question. Let us bring the Ark of the Lord's covenant from Shiloh so that it may go with us and save us from the hands of of the enemies. So the people sent men to Shiloh and they brought back the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord Almighty, who was enthroned between the cherubim. And Eli's two sons, Phineas and Hophni, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. So here's their grand plan. They're going to take the Ark of God, God's covenant here, and they're going to take this sacred object of the Lord's and carry it into battle. That's their plan. Why in the world would they do that? Did anybody stop to think, gee, I, I, I wonder if this thing was meant to be used this way. Um, <clears throat> they didn't really think of that. Was it meant to be used that way? Like it wouldn't there be some evidence in history of people doing that? Like wouldn't they, they, they would know their scripture. They could look back and say, all right, well, I see here every time that there's been a battle like this, they've taken the ark and they've, they've won. Like there's no evidence of that. Perhaps they remembered the story when Joshua took Jericho. And as they were traveling through the wilderness and now they're crossing over and taking the city of Jericho, they did in fact have the ark with them back then. How God had told Joshua to send the priests forward with the ark at that battle. You know, it was with Joshua as they entered and conquered the promised land, but that was the only battle he took it in. It was then set up in the tabernacle at Shiloh for some 400 years. It was not used in other battles. By this time, they weren't expressly told to do so by God. God did not say, hey, take this ark into battle and I will be there. My presence will be there and you will win. They did not ask God about this. They just came up with this plan on their own. Let's see what happens. Well, maybe they figured that God would certainly not let the ark be captured because this is God's presence on earth, right? Certainly God's going to not let that happen. So <clears throat> God doesn't want the ark captured. That's certainly what they're thinking. Hey, God, you have to stop. You have to help us now. You have to stop them from beating us because we have your ark. But that's not how God works. Let's see what became of their plan now. In 1 Samuel 4, verses 5 through 11, we read on. When the ark of the Lord's covenant came into the camp, all Israel raised such a great shout that the ground shook. Hearing the uproar, the Philistines asked, What's all the shouting in the Hebrew camp? So right now we see that like now the Israelites are just getting riled up because now they have the Ark of the Covenant. They have God's presence there. They're thinking, all right, surely God is going to be with us. So they're so loud, the ground shakes and the Philistines are starting to get a little scared, starting to get a little scared. When they learned that the Ark of the Lord had come into the camp, the Philistines were afraid. Okay, it sounds like their plan's going good. Maybe. A God has come into the camp, they said. We're in trouble. Nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us. Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? There are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the desert. Be strong, Philistines. Be men, or you will be subject to these Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought and the Israelites were defeated and every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was so great, Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. The Ark of God was captured and Eli's two sons, Phineas and Hophni, died. So 30,000 is, is quite a bit more than the 4,000 they'd lost before. But it doesn't look like their plan worked. They thought for sure, if we take the ark into battle, we're going to win. But one thing we want to look at here, the ark was not a lucky charm. They thought it was going to certainly bring them victory. They thought it was going to be their good luck charm to, to help them win out, but it wasn't. When the ark arrived, the Israels were ecstatic. They were just overjoyed, like, yes, yes, we're going to win this now. The Philistines figured out what was going on and they were afraid, but this fear drove them to fight even harder. This fear they had for what was going on. They're like, we just, we got to, we got like, they, they were fighting for the lives at that point because they knew what would happen. 30,000 Israelites died that day. Others fled, abandoning the ark. They left the ark in the battlefield. I want you to realize this. They took God's sacred object. They took it to battle and they left it there when they got scared. The Philistines captured the ark. That doesn't sound good. Okay, so what's going to happen with this Dagon character we're looking at here in a little bit? 
Um, we're getting to that part. First Samuel five verses one through five. After the Philistines had captured the ark of God, they took it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then they carried the ark into Dagon's temple and set it beside Dagon. So after capturing the ark, they took it to Ashdod, which is um, where, where the, the house of their God is, the temple of their God. The ark was taken to the house of Dagon. Dagon was the head of their pagan gods, of the Philistines. And he was supposed to be this half man, half fish creature. Um, you've probably heard a little bit about that studying the Old Testament here. So this weird half man, half fish creature. Um, and the ark of God was placed as an offering from war before their statue of their, their little G God, signifying in their mind that their God was greater than the God of the Israelites, the God of the Hebrews. Now things start to get interesting though, because now we have God's ark placed down here in this temple. We have this statue of their God standing up before it. And let's see what happens in the morning. When the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. They took Dagon and put him back into his place. Imagine the shock on the priest's face whenever they walk in and they see the statue of their God falling down almost as in worship to the Ark of the, of the Covenant, this representation of the, the God of the Israelites. You know, certainly they seemed a little embarrassed. They're like, come on, please don't embarrass us. Get back up. What are you doing? You're supposed to be better than this. Uh, but so they took their statue and they stood it back up. They thought their God was greater because of their victory. They thought standing it back up would fix it. They thought standing the statue of their God back up would prove that their God was greater. But let's keep going. Let's keep going here. But the following morning, when they rose, there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. His head and hands had broken off and were lying on the threshold. Only his body remained. That's why to this day, neither the priests of Dagon nor any others who enter Dagon's temple at Ashdod step on the threshold. So, so he falls down a second time. In a final act of humiliation, the head of the statue and the hands of the statue are lying on the threshold, the entrance to the temple where you can't miss it. Like maybe, maybe people didn't see the statue had fallen down before as they're passing by because the priest got in there and stood it up, the priest of, of Dagon. But now like his hands and head are on the threshold, the very entrance to the temple where everybody that passes by see it. So this final act of humiliation against their God. So um, think back to what's in this ark. Remember what's in the ark, the 10 commandments. What is the very first commandment written on there? You shall have no other gods before me. So the sacred object that holds the, the, the laws that God gave to Moses is now sitting there and the very first words written on there talk about not having other gods before him. You see, the Philistines had a chance to repent when they first saw this. They're shown that no God can stand before the God of the Israelites. No God can stand before the Almighty. Instead, they chose to ignore the message. They're like, well, let's just stand it back up. I don't know why he fell down here. Um, but they, they took this, this Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of God's presence, and they, they put it in their temple. You know, the Bible goes on to tell us they didn't just get rid of the Ark then. They tried to just go on with life. But the people that lived in that city broke out in sores because, because they, they tried to hold on to the Ark of the Covenant instead of uh, giving it back to the Israelites. They later were able to return it and they, they didn't get better till then. But it's a very interesting story as we look through here because this is a really great representation of the power of our almighty God. See, all the little gods that these other people worshiped have no power next to our big God, our almighty God, the one and only God that we worship. So yeah, that's a cool story. Sometimes we skip over it when we're reading through the Old Testament. We won't really realize how awesome that story is. But what does it mean for us? What can we really take out of that? How can we apply that? You know, oftentimes we come to the almighty creator of the universe with too much familiarity. Sometimes we, we, just, we, we just treat him like he's just, I mean, he is a friend of ours, but we just treat him with, like we're just too familiar with him. These Israelites had forgotten to show God the proper fear that he deserves. These Israelites thought that um, they could just do whatever they want and God would just do what they asked him to do. You know, but I'm not talking about the same fear that God's presence brings to the enemies because we see the fear, we see the fear that the, the, um, the Philistines were showing whenever they hear that God's presence is now in their camp, in the Israelites' camp. We see that they're so afraid that they're, they're scared to death 
But that's not the fear we're talking about. As we revere God, there's a fear that we have. It's more of a healthy respect that we should have for God. Oftentimes we approach God without this healthy respect. We don't, we don't really give him the respect he deserves, the honor he deserves in our life. We're just too familiar in that case. There's nothing like this all-powerful creator God that we have, and we should treat him as such. And oftentimes, not only do we not approach him with the reverence that we should, because yes, yes, absolutely, he is our Abba Father. We should come before him as a loving father uh, and the loving God that he is. We should have some familiarity with him. Like there's a relationship that we should have there, but there's still a reverence um, that we need to show um, to him as well. Oftentimes, we also try to use God for our own advantage. We become like Eli's sons and take advantage of what God can do for us instead of offering God all that we have. It's not about what God can do for us. It's about what we can do for God and how we can show him that he is worthy of everything that he's given us. He's worthy of our lives. He's worthy of our time. We often try to make him our lucky charm instead of our helper. We, we try to get him on board with our plans instead of us getting on board with his plans. Because it's not just, he's not just the God that we can ask for anything and he'll just provide um, our very, I mean, he will provide for us, but like not just our, our fancies and whims, like it's, it has to be done in his will. We have to get in line with his will and then he will provide everything we need. We try to fit God in with all the gods of this world. Oftentimes we do that, believe it or not. We try to fit him in with everything else that we're worshiping and what you worship is what you're giving your time to. So um, God should get our best, not our leftovers. Oftentimes we, we have time for God when there's time. We have to make time sometimes. We, we don't put him first in our life. We don't prioritize time with God. And I'm guilty of it too, just as everybody else is, because there's so many other things in the day that we, we try to make time for. And then it's like, if there's any time left, I'll go spend some time with God. But God should get our best, not our leftovers. But we try to make him fit into our lives instead of letting him change our lives to what he wants us to be. We have to be open to letting him change us and not trying to make him fit into what we've made of ourselves. So yes, God is a personal loving God, but we should be careful that we don't let ourselves slip into a familiarity with him that makes us lose our reverence for him. We have to find a balance between the familiarity that we should have with God as our Abba Father, a loving God and Father, and the reverence, respect, and honor due to him as Lord. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this chance to be able to, to look at this, this story in the Old Testament, God, and just see the awesomeness that, that there is of you, Lord, and how you just, um, you show up, God, not in the way we expect, but you show up and show that you are almighty, and you are the powerful one, Lord, and you are the God. You are Lord of Lords, King of Kings. Lord, we just pray that you'll be able to help us apply this to our lives and be able to live lives full of you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen.